So thank you very much for the invitation to come along today. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to answer the question um, entirely, but what I do want to do is share with you some thoughts and observations around that interface between uh, analysts, uh, academia and uh, policy. Um, so I'm Siobhan Carey, I'm the Chief Executive of uh, NISRA and I've been in post now just over nine months. So. We had some new staff st starting this morning where I said, well, I feel like I'm still a newbie, but with, uh, uh, so one of them had only walked in the building for the first time yesterday, so I was beaten. Um, so what I'm going to cover are, I'm going to do a little bit of myth-busting, because I always like to do that, particularly if there are any policy colleagues in the room. I'm going to tell you why I don't care about data, and <laughs> then I'm going to go through the three different actors in this space, which are sort of government analysts, uh, policy makers and the wider research community because so this could have been the shortest presentation ever where how, how does government use uh, research and evidence I could have said brilliantly and sat down <laughs> um, but I think we all know that uh, there's we could do better so um, so why is it important that um, we get the use of evidence in government right and I think everyone agrees that we want government to make the best decisions and we want them to make good choices and that we recognise that sometimes those decisions and choices will be ideologically based but the general expectation is that those choices and decisions should be made on the best available evidence. Um, so I have five myths busters I want to go through. So first of all, I mean, I have been in the government's social research for a number of years and the government statistical uh, service and you keep hearing things that oh it's all rocket science and oh, it was all very complicated it isn't um, and sort of people can sort of I spent quite a bit of my time looking at adult literacy and numeracy um, so I did the international adult literacy survey in the mid 1970s where we went back and we interviewed people having done the test about why did you answer it this way that way and loads of people would say to us that flick through the test and they go oh numbers I don't do numbers or oh percentages I don't do percentages and we'll move on um, and we know that if the civil service is reflective of the general population then there will be colleagues among us who are going do I want to talk to someone whose email is scary a scary and whose title is chief statistician <laughs> and when I worked in the Department for International Development I kept getting all my meetings cancelled with people and I discovered that they would see scary see statistics and just go oh, I'll put her off for a couple of weeks <laughs> um, so people think it's rocket science um, uh, there is no point in us collecting data and doing research if it's just for keeping statisticians and researchers and economists in nice interesting um, environments. Um, if it's not being used then what's the point of collecting it? So our job is not done when we have collected the research, published it and moved on to our next juicy project. So, um, so there's no, if it's not being used there's no point. Um, people think this is expensive and my retort to that is how expensive is it not to have the evidence? So if you're spending a lot of money on a big policy intervention and you don't have any evidence and it doesn't deliver what you thought, then how expensive was that? When I worked um, with, uh, I said, in international development and capacity building, we always faced this problem. Uh, and we eventually called it the $3 million question because we would have conversations with government where we're saying, listen, you need a survey on health and on sanitation and all of these things it'll cost about three million and the government would come back and the Minister of Health would say, if I had three million, I would be spending it on HIV antiretrovirals. And we're going, but how do you know that that's not a drop in the ocean? Because you have no data on HIV prevalence in your country. So how do you know that it's either going to solve your problem or that it's, not, it's going to be so small an intervention that it's not going to make any difference? So in terms of the, the amount of a program you should spend on making sure you've got the data. Um, having no data is really expensive. So people think, oh, I've got such a large amount of money to do that. I think we'd worked out that if we'd spent 0.01% of the program money on making sure we had the data, we would have had more data than we could have ever, um, ever managed. 
Uh, people think it's formal is produced by geeks, and I know that there's lots of people um, who, when you, uh, you go out to do a presentation, they're going, oh, the statistician is coming to talk to us, they're just going, yeah, I'll just bring the newspaper so I can read it under there, or have my smartphone. Um, so they're not thinking it's going to be engaging. And this is, I know, what uh, when they think of a statistician, this is what they think of. And I showed this um, picture in when I was at the CSO, and someone said, oh, that's Bill when he joined. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so we know we've got uh, an issue about how people perceive sort of the people who like to, who like to do the numbers. Um, so it's not formal. As produ- we do have some people in the profession that um, fit this. But uh, you can only you can't see the whole slide actually. I don't know why that is, but um, so something to do. Oh, well, I don't know. It's probably just the new version of Windows. Um, so you know we've got a presentation problem. Uh, uh, if that's what people think we are, this was generated from. Um, we did a something called um, draw a statistician. Um, and we went out to a whole load of policy colleagues and we said, tell us what you think a statistician is. And basically they said, it's a male, he's got bottle and glasses, uh, looks like a geek, he's got unkempt hair and he wouldn't want to get stuck in the lift with him. So um, that's... <laughs> I said, sometimes that's me, but uh, not, not generally. The other big myth is that data grows on trees. And the number of people sort of who have... have made a decision, gone off and, and implemented a policy and then when they're asked, well, how did it go and what happened, they sort of shrug their shoulders and say, oh, there isn't any data. So my challenge back would be that if you're running the programme and you haven't made sure that the data is being collected, then whose responsibility, responsibility was it? Um, so data only exists because someone has gone to the bother of collecting it, harvesting, curating it, and um, particularly in as services move online, we need to make sure that we're really paying attention to the underlying data model so that um, the data that's being harvested from that is uh, fit for purpose. So if they're all the myths, then you know this is just a summary that you all know about how data and research evidence is used, um, and of course just noting at the end that you can lie with them because the first two are about it's simply when people say it's rocket science I say it's not it's just measuring stuff we measure stuff all the time um, but uh, just because it's called statistics or national accounts or something obscure that um, people think it's something that's not simply measuring um, and of course we all know that we can lie with them we've all well the older people among us will remember the um, yes minister uh, uh, episode where he used the same piece of data to prove both sides of the argument um, very well. Um, so if you haven't seen it, Google it, you'll, you'll find it. Um, so I said, partly we're using the data in research to describe the current events, the trends, um, to look at what how it might inform future decisions. So, you know, modelling scenarios, um, what's the impact on different groups, is it rolling out as planned, understanding what happened as a choice, a consequence of the decision. And really for calling people to account and then for evaluating the outcomes. So I always like to ask this question about research and statistics for who? And when I said that I don't care about data, I meant it. Um, I absolutely love data. I've spent three and a half decades collecting data and being in that space of uh, the interface between data and research and, and policy choices. But I don't care about it because I don't need it. So I'm not the person who has to make the choice. Um, I'm not the person who's deciding this three million, will I spend it on HIV antiretrovirals or will I spend it on a demographic and health survey? I'm not the person (coughs) who chooses policy intervention A over policy intervention B. But if I was that person, I would sort of want to have some data to make those decisions on um, because in God we trust, but could all others please bring some data to the <laughs> policy choices? <laughs> so, so what are the issues um, that I've observed? Key thing is, people spend far too much time looking for the research. Uh, in some areas, I would say that, uh, particularly in the int- world of international development, you spend 90% of your available time looking for the data that leaves you 
10% of time for looking at it. Um, and you really want to be able to flip that around. You want to be able to spend 5 five or 10% of your time trying to locate the data you want and all of the rest of the time looking at it and developing that insight. Um, so when you found the data, then you discovered that you've actually found several different sources and they're all telling different things. A really good example of this is when you, again from international development, when you put um, for an individual country in Africa and you look and you say what's school enrolment and you find four or five different measures that all purport to be for the same year and you discover one is from the National Statistical Office, one is from the local ministry, one is from the um, UNESCO Institute for Education, one is from the World Bank and one is probably from um, a regional statistical body and they're all different and they're not just different by two or three percentage points they're different by 10, 15, 20 percentage points so really understanding why one organisation chose to use the ATLAS method and the other organisation chose to use something different becomes really important so often you're faced with five different numbers and so people will then choose the one that suits them best rather than the one that's best for answering the question so where is the big insight? Uh, people, you found the research, you're um, trying to get to grips with it and understand it, but you're really wanting that, what's my big takeaway? What's the single big insight that this is giving me? Um, and often you find that it only provides the partial evidence. So I've now got a little bit of understanding about this part of the problem, but I don't have it about the other. And sometimes it's just written in a way that you're going, I'm now on page three, there's 400 pages in this thing. I don't even know if I'm going to get to some key points by the time I get to page 100. So making it really accessible. Has everybody here got a smartphone in their pocket? Yeah? How many people have two smartphones in their pocket? Yeah. You're used to being able to just go take your phone out of your pocket and find data immediately. And you know, if you picked up a nap that you had to spend ages trying to figure out what it's telling you, you just wouldn't use it. So if we want people to use research and evidence. We need to make it easy to find, easy to understand, highlight the big key messages, get them drawn into it, make sure that it's as comprehensive as possible and written in a really accessible way. So coming to the three players, what can government analysts do? So these um, analysts are embedded right across departments in Northern Ireland. About half of them are in the Department of Finance in the centre. The other half are um, embedded out. So you're working closely with policy colleagues throughout the process. They're doing things like statistical publications, ad hoc analysis, commissioning bespoke surveys, sort of in that mix around how do you evaluate it, can, you know, what, what do you make of this evidence versus that evidence. It works best when that conversation is happening really early on and when the analysts as well as the policy colleagues are showing a really strong curiosity. So that they've already been in looking at the analysis or saying, oh, I wonder why that is. I wonder, sort of, could that be linked to that? So they've already, by the time they're engaged in that conversation, gone through quite a process of internalising and asking questions about the data. And it works best when it's not like the um, Gary Larson cartoon where, I don't know if you know it, with the, the man and what, what, what humans say to dogs and what dogs hear. So the human is saying to the dog, Ginger, if you go in that trash can again, Ginger, I'm going to you know, stop all your treats and Ginger this and Ginger that. And what the dog hears is blah, 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 Ginger, blah, 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 Ginger. Um, so making sure that that's a really effective dialogue um, and developing that um, common understanding. So what can policymakers do? So policymakers in the room? Who? Yeah, Joe. <laughs> um, really basic question, ask at the beginning of everything and finish every um, conversation with how am I going to measure it. Take responsibility. I said, I don't need the data, but I love helping people have the data that they need. So who's responsible for making it happen? Um, is it the, pol you know, if policy colleagues think that someone else is out there sorting out data that they haven't specified and that it's all just going to exist, then it's not going to happen. So it's about taking responsibility for making sure that measurement is happening. Um, know what data you have. Often you're sitting on masses of data and you it's it's below the it's below the waves, um, right down deep in the organization. But do you really know what data you have? And can you access it? So are you able to actually use the data that you already got? 
and ask questions endlessly, endlessly, endlessly. Just keep asking questions about why is this, you know, how did that um, impact on something else? Um, so understanding sort of what do I know, what could I know, and what do I need to do to know, and what do I need to do to make that um, knowledge and research exist. And please don't say, I don't do numbers. Um, I'd argue if, if you're going to say I don't do numbers and not comfortable with handling research evidence, then why are you in that job? Because the ev analysis and use of evidence is central to making those big decisions. So what can the wider research community do? Um, so make sure your research is relevant. Um, you know, it needs to be on the topics of the day. It needs to be um, uh, addressing questions that are extant in society or in the economy. And really understand who your users are. So I ask the question, data and research for who? So who's going to be interested in the results of this and why? Is it just they're interested because, well, it's quite interesting, or are they interested because they're going to need to make a decision on it? And what decisions does it support? Uh, it needs to be timely, um, knowing what happened 10 years ago. Um, I mean, statisticians were always accused of being the people who look in the rear view mirror. Uh, so we're telling you what happened yesterday or probably what happened three years ago. Um, so making it timely and making it exciting and communicating. Um, so again, uh, make sure that they can find it, that they can understand it and that they can retain the insight. Um, so those are the three players. In terms of administrative data, um, this has really changed dramatically. Uh, this is what uh, administrative data looked at. I worked in an office in the mid-70s that was probably looked a little bit like this as a temporary, um, as a student, where there was cupboards and cupboards and cupboards of stuff that, you know, who knew what was in it? It was probably all really interesting and probably has been digitised since, but um, I love this. I love this photograph. The calm on the desk and the, just the chaos behind. But administrative data um, used to be very difficult to access, whereas now we're all using sort of NI Direct, and that is leaving a trace. And d data has been captured all the time. So the whole landscape of administrative data has changed. We now have the Digital Economy Act, which was passed in April, which allows data sharing for um, administ for statistics and research purposes, among others. So what's the opportunity? Um, so the programme for government has data very much at its heart. You'll have seen sort of the high level outcomes. You'll have seen all the indicators. It's setting a clear direction of travel in terms of the approach. Um, so very much outcome based accountability, um, sort of monitoring and measuring and setting, uh, having measures that you know what the parameters are for has it changed or has it not. It's underpinned by a very collaborative delivery model. Um, so there's really an opportunity to join up the evidence and the M&E model. So the evidence at the beginning of the process, the monitoring and evaluation at the end. And um, it feels like a sort of game changer uh, in terms of how that interaction between policy, research and analysis um, can, can work together. Uh, so what what would those opportunities deliver? So I think it's about having better policy decisions, being able to target service delivery. So if you think of the huge amount of administrative data that now sits in um, in government, being able to use that to make much more targeted interventions, it also gives you low cost transaction costs. Uh, so it lowers your operations, makes you more efficient. It makes you better able to handle a crisis. It can reduce your fraud, error, and debt. So it saves the government money. Uh, it can introduce innovation into the economy, you can have a better informed public debate and it can also enhance national security. So I wanted to leave you with this slide, uh, which is one of my favourites. It's not attributed because it's disputed as to who said it. It's supposed to be Deming, but someone said that Deming was quoting Aristotle or something, I don't know. But um, I think it's a nice place to pause because um, without data you are just another person with an opinion. So I'm going to leave it there, sort of my, my thoughts on how the interactions work and what we collectively could do to improve that whole um, uh, Venn diagram that you showed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay.